Welcome to HBTV. I'm Harry Binswanger, the HB of HBTV. I'm a philosopher who advocates Ayn Rand's philosophy of objectivism. For several sessions, we've been talking about a key tenet of objectivism, which is that man is a being of volitional consciousness, to quote Ayn Rand's phrase in Atlas Shrugged. And I feel the need to review in very essentialized terms what we covered previously because I know there are people tuning in for the first time to this episode. That This episode will be devoted after a brief review to what does it mean? What does it mean for you? Ayn Rand's theory of free will. What does it mean to you and for your life and your uh, character? So the review is that Ayn Rand identified that beneath all the particular choices, uh, the existential choices, the, the choices you make in physical action, and even the choices that you make about how to guide your thinking, there's the question of, are you in charge? Are you thinking? Or are you drifting non-thinking, or even evading, anti-thinking, pushing stuff out of your consciousness. Beneath that, or as the underpinnings of that, is a basic um, state that she calls mental focus. Are you in full mental focus? Which means, are you selecting the level of awareness that you apply to what you are doing right now. So for instance, you're walking down the street, you have no particular um, issue preying upon you, and you're just enjoying the sights. So a low level of awareness in the sense of less active integration, less abstract thought, less conceptualization, just Enjoying, gee, it looks pretty. I'm in Naples, Florida now, and we got blue sky, 82 degrees, and there's an orange tree outside my window, and I could just look at them and do minimal thinking. Doesn't it look nice? Boy, those oranges are ripe. You know, it's not, nothing high level. But there are times when you need to raise the abstractness of your thought, the degree of effort that you put into it, and the issue of being in focus means you are sensitive to and pay attention to the level of abstraction, a level of awareness that you should apply to a given situation. It means that you are being purposeful. You're watching what's going on in your mind. And if you get a sense, no, I need to do some thinking here, you do it. So to be in focus is to be prepared to proportion the level of your awareness, how abstract, how integrative, how conceptual it is, to, to uh, proportion that level to the actual needs of the situation as you read it, or can read it if you would turn your mind to that. Now, this is not automatic. You don't automatically come into focus when something needs your attention. Because focus is not just concentration. I gave the example of everybody. What? Huh? You can attract somebody's attention. You can wave your hands in front of him, and he can't not attend to you. If, if, if a guy on the sidewalk as you're walking down the street starts gesticulating wildly, you're going to pay attention to that. You're going to concentrate your mind on that. That's automatic. But what's not automatic is the managerial function, the purposeful orientation, the look, the supervising of what goes on in your mind and for instance, you're thinking, how much attention should I give to this? How important is it? 
So concentration is simply uh, attention exclusively uh, uh, reserved for one topic. It's the one thing in your mind as opposed to other things. Now, that's different from focus. Focus often means concentrating, but not always. But focus means managing what you attend to. Proportioning the level of your awareness to your sense of what needs attention or what does not. And I summarize it all as, are you driving your mind? I don't mean that in a uh, sense of, oh, he's got a lot of drive, a phrase from the 50s. But are you at the wheel? Are you driving the, your own conceptual functioning, your own mental, intellectual state and activities? Or are you just blissed out, just drifting, just a passenger? So to be the driver of your mind versus the, a passenger kind of passively watching the scene go by that someone else is putting in front of your eyes because he's driving, that's the alternative. Drive or be driven by. Okay, so that's the review. So what is the meaning of that choice? No one else has ever said this, by the way. You can search the history of philosophy. You can find hints of it a sentence here and there, but in terms of an entire introspectively derived view of the relation of your conscious choices to the automatic functions of your mind, Ayn Rand's the only one who's ever even gone there. So what is the meaning of it? Well, my God, its, <laughs> it's meaning is cosmic. Its meaning is metaphysical. Ayn Rand uses the term metaphysical to mean pertaining to the essentials of, real, of your relation to reality. You know, not trivial, transitory, what you call journalistic, like today's headlines, but deep and abiding essential, fundamental issue for you as a being in the world. So uh, this is the choice to be or not to be mentally. The choice to drive or be a passenger is the choice to have a self or not. When you're just reacting and in a dazed Drifting along, somebody says something, you blurt out something in response. You might be having a lot of feelings, but you, the essential you, the self, your ego, is on vacation. It's not there. It's absent without leave. <clears throat> to be or not to be means to drive your mind, or merely react. So the very choice we're talking about is the choice to have a self, have an ego, have an essential you, or not. Because you aren't your feelings. You aren't your automatic uh, recall. You are the entity that is in charge and sets a purpose, and directs your mind, and therefore your life. The choice to focus, drive, take charge, is also biologically fundamental for a human being. It's to be or not to be in the sense of to the extent that you are not in charge, you're in danger. You're in danger of death. You're on the death principle. You're on the road that the full consistent expression of which will be your death. To see this, imagine that we were talking about the 
perceptual level of your functioning, the sensory perceptual level, not the conceptual level. So imagine that you had to walk around with blindfolds on. Well, pretty soon you're going to walk off a cliff or get hit by a car or something bad is going to happen to you. And you can sense that. So you'd be very nervous and apprehensive. It's the same if you have a conceptual blindfold on. If you don't do the work to understand reality. You may live to be 96, which Bertrand Russell did. But you live in danger and it's mere luck that you, that you survived that long. And it really has to do with the rationality of other people to do the thinking, the rational thinking that you need to do. Now, you might be thinking, well, Bertrand Russell did a lot of thinking. He raised his level of awareness. No. He did a lot of ratiocination. He did a lot of mental exercises. He put forth a lot of effort, but it was unanchored to reality. Did you know he once said, I'm not sure I'm not a poached egg? It's been said that Russell has the distinction of having endorsed every wrong issue on every topic, every wrong position on every topic. He changed his mind over the course of his life frequently. So the point here is not to attack Bertrand Russell, who's a pretty much negligible, pathetic character, but to make the distinction between mental effort and thinking. Thinking is a purposeful mental process to identify reality in propositional form. It's to answer a question by saying the answer is S is P, where S and P are variables for subject and predicate. So don't confuse focus and thinking with phony, pseudo-focus uh, and pseudo-thinking. And it's not a subtle thing, right? Pseudo-focus is concentration when you shouldn't be concentrating on what you're concentrating on. So like uh, saying a mantra to yourself is over and over again. Nearer my God to thee, somebody, a former objectivist, told me was now his mantra. He repeats it over and over. Nearer my God to thee. You're sort of concentrating, but that's not focus. Or you're concentrating on one thing in order to prevent yourself from re recognizing something else that you should be recognizing. That's not focus. And... Not every saying of words in your mind or solving of puzzles is thinking. Thinking is a purposeful and logical mental process, logical to the best of your ability, to identify reality, not to play mental games. So uh, the... The choice to think or not to think is a choice to identify reality, find out the truth, to get in touch with the long-range consequences. Like inflation, what is it? I mean economic monetary inflation, what is it? Now, there are two ways of approaching that question. One is to logically, purposefully try to identify thinking of examples of inflation, looking for the essential. And the other is to play a tape. Oh, well, uh, the New York Times said that inflation was due to uh, labor costs going up. And I remember hearing on MSNBC that it's uh, due, uh, due to the greed of businessmen. Now, that's not thinking. That's not rationality. That's not raising your level of awareness. That's coasting. Because what are the unasked questions? 
Why do labor costs go up? How can employers spend more for labor when they weren't spending it before? Where does that money come from? And the answers to that are not self-evident. Or, oh, it's the greed of businessmen that are raising prices. So for the last 30 years, they haven't been greedy. The last 30 years, they, they were saying, no, I don't, I don't really need any more money. We're doing fine. Yeah, you let's lower our prices because uh, we don't want to be greedy. We're good Christians. We, we don't want to be too attached. Here, go ahead. Incidentally, here's another unasked question. What would happen to such a business in competition with another business that's saying of equal ability of, in production, saying profit, everything has to make a profit. The more profit, the better. Every fact of this business operation has to be aimed at making the highest pro uh, profit possible. Well, that firm is going to outcompete the supposed imaginary fantasy, ridiculous idea of, oh, no, we have enough money. If there were such a firm or firms, it, they would be driven into bankruptcy by a profit-oriented firm because a profit-oriented firm would be able to lower prices below what that lazy firm could, could do. Okay, so that's an example of question not asked. Greed? Oh, what about greed in the past? Suddenly there's an upswing of greed? And what about the greed of the consumer? The purchaser, doesn't the purchaser want to get the best for his dollar that he can? So this, are purchasers now more docile? So the whole thing doesn't stand up to a moment's thought, which is not given to it because merely reacting to, oh, yeah, so I read that editorial, so I guess it's this. That is not thinking. That is not focus. That is not driving your mind. That is precisely being a passenger. So the biological meaning of, for you, of the choice to think or not to think, to focus or not to focus, is to know what the nature is of the thing you're dealing with. Can I trust this person? Can I not? Should I make this investment? Should I not? Should I take this job? Should I not? Should I marry this person or should I not? Those are questions that can't be answered on the perceptual level. They require thinking and few people do it. So I've covered the metaphysical meaning of focus, to be or not to be, to have a self, and the biological meaning, which is to gain the knowledge that will optimize your chances of living and living successfully or not. The moral uh, meaning of it, which is the third dimension I want to talk about, comes out of the other two. Because for, as Ayn Rand identified, the purpose of a moral code is to tell you the right kind of choices. The choices, that is, that will lead to your optimal survival. The choices that are consistent with the, your biological nature and, and your biological needs, including the needs of your consciousness. So I have a little equation. Morality equals biology plus choice. Biology plus choice, meaning morality comes up as an issue because you can live or you can die. That's the biology. And to live, you have to live in a certain way. You can't live by sending, putting your fingers into the soil and hoping to photosynthesize or waiting for your instincts to make you run with the pack like a dog or a wolf. Your means of survival is reason. 
thinking. That's man's biological, ecological niche. That's his specific competitive advantage against all the other animals. He can't outrun them. He can't outfight them. He can't hide like the zebra in the shadows because he's got protective coloration. He's got a mind. And in the words of one biologist, it has raised him to the status of the Lord of creation. We dominate the planet because of our minds, not because we've got muscles or good armor. We don't. So morality comes up because you face the alternative of life versus death, and you need to think. If you're going to live, you need to think. So your basic choice is what morality is concerned with. So morality, for instance, does not say, well, have a lot of money. Because that's not choice. Morality is the manual to tell you how to operate your life. And it only concerns those things over which you have control, volitional control. So um, a, if your basic choice is to focus your mind or not and your life depends on it, morality says, do it. Focus. Think. Drive your mind. Manage it. Be somebody. Now, what is the long-term um, result of making one kind of choice or the other? In Atlas Shrugged, the hero says, man is a being of self-made soul. Self-made soul, meaning... You forge your own character. The choices that you make, organize or don't organize your mental equipment. And it sets up what can be automatized, gets automatized one way or another. So if you're always in focus, always seeking the truth, always trying to understand what you sense needs to be understand, understood by you, you organize your brain and material that comes to you comes in a logical, connected fashion and it's relevant, fertile, essentialized so you can deal with it. If you're the kind of person who just drifts and is a passenger in his own mind, what what's stored in your brain will be associations. Back in an earlier episode, I made up an inner monologue for two students. And one of them thinks logically and the other just random associates. Part of the reward of thinking logically is your mental files get organized logically. So what is triggered to come into consciousness is something relevant, generally. Certainly high, much more relevant than what comes into the mind of a non-thinking, drifting, or evading person. So, for instance, I can give these lectures to, to brag. I can give this talk. I just have uh, my notes of, of a few topics on one page. It's like 30 words here. Because I've stored all this material. I've thought about this. I've written on it. I've programmed my subconscious, my brain files, to send me the material, material that's relevant. And we know this from physical sports, the same thing. You know, you toss a basketball to Michael Jordan, and he, he's not going to, you know, he's going to deftly get it. And even if he's talking, having a conversation, it makes a shot, you know, after hours, so to speak. His automatic functioning, his don't even think about it, carry on a conversation functioning, is fantastically good. 
let alone his focused intent, concentrated uh, effort during an actual game. And that's because of the practice. That's because of the way he has filed physical connections. Well, you can do the same thing with your mental connections, and then logical material comes to mind. Aristotle said we become honest by being honest. We become just by performing just acts, and that is profoundly correct. Self-made soul means your character is the moving average of the choices that you make, little and big, moment by moment. So your character now is the sum, the moving average, so to speak, of over your whole life with more emphasis on the last period than on earlier periods, but still your whole life. That's why it's a moving average rather than just an average. That means that what's possible for you to do now, and I'm talking now about existential actions, is limited by the way that you have used your free will up to now. It's limited, but there's still a range of what you can do to shift the margin. So, for instance, it would not be possible for me to decide, you know, I want to get some cocaine and sniff it. Or, I don't know, I just feel like punching somebody today. I'm going to do the next guy I see in the street, I'm going to punch. Or, uh, I'm going to support the Build It Back Better bill. I don't know, I just, I have free will, I'm just going to do that. I can't. I don't, even if I surrender to the automatic functions and run on autopilot, even when I'm a passenger, because of the way I've used my mind to pass, a lot of things I couldn't do. And the same in another way, a person who's been a lifelong follower of the progressive uh, crowd and, and uh, uh, conformist to that can't suddenly say, you know, I think capitalism is right. However, you can shift the margins. If you start thinking and start moving in a certain direction, it's like exercise. You know, you can't decide tomorrow, I'm going to be uh, like Arnold Schwarzenegger. I'm going to be able to play basketball like Michael Jordan, I'm just going to will it. No, but what you could do is I'm going to start weightlifting tomorrow or I'm going to start going to the basketball court and practicing. And gradually, you re-automatize or automatize for the first time, new connections. And over years, you can be quite a different basketball player or phys physique person, you know, you can have, maybe you can't get to Arnold Schwarzenegger, but you can sure get a lot different from the way you are if you never work out. And I don't think anyone disputes that. So if you flex your mental muscles, not just flex them, if you work them out and use them a lot, they get stronger. And the way they get stronger is by the way you file information in your brain. So under inflation, the first thing that maybe pops into your mind is, uh, what did I read on that? But the logical first thing is, what is inflation? What do I mean by that term? Where does it come from? What discrimination does it make? Oh, well, it's opposed to deflation. What's the difference? And then you pursue a path. You can do that. Okay, we're at the end, um, and there's another topic for next time, which is, if what I'm saying is true, how come almost all Catholics are children of Catholics? 
and almost all Jews are children of Jews, and almost all uh, rednecks are children of rednecks, and so on. How do I square that with the idea that man is a being of self-made soul? And there's a very interesting answer, which I'll take up next Monday. Uh, but Dylan, I think we should stop here with a thanks to the Ayn Rand Institute for supporting this, and I hope that you will donate to this show or to the Ayn Rand Institute in the name of this show. Next week to be continued. Thank you very much.